warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Nahmaduhu wa nisalli ala rasul al-nabi al-kareem A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Ar-Rahmanirrahim Maliki yawmiddin Iyaka na'budu wa iyaka nasta'in Ihdana al-sirat al-mustaqim Sirat al-lazina an'amda alayhim غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شأن حبيبه إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم سلوا وسلم بارك على سيدنا مولانا محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبصار وديائها وعلى آله وسهبه دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم Today is the 17th of the الحج So less than two weeks and Muharram will start. Uh, and as we've talked about before, everything is connected. You know, if you look at the Quran, you know, each verse is connected to the one before it and the one after it. Each surah is connected to the one before it and the one after it. And Allah SWT has laid out all of this. And in the same way, each month is connected to the one before it and the one after it. So Zil Hajj of course is the month of Hajj and we celebrate the sacrifice of Ibrahim uh, And as we mentioned on the day of Eid, the sacrifice of Ibrahim is pointing toward another sacrifice which is in reality, the sacrifice of Rasulullah which is the sacrifice of Imam Hussein al-Islam in the field of Karbala. And Allah SWT alludes to this in the Quran where he says, أَعُوذِ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ شَيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَفَذَيْنَاهُ بِذِبْهِ عَذِي وَتَرَفْنَا عَلَيْهِ فِي الْآخِرِينَ You know, and we have ransomed, when talking about Ismail al we have ransomed him with a great sacrifice. And we have postponed this for later generations. Inshallah, we will have a program in honor of Imam Hussein al-Islam, probably the beginning of September. Uh, but you know, I want to, over the next few weeks, go over some of the background to all of this. You know, nothing happens in isolation. You know, historically or even in our own lives, nothing happens in a bubble. You know, if you look at any, the way people, or what happens and the way people react and everything, there's always a history behind it. There's a background to it. And in order to understand the event, you have to understand the background. You know, just like in the Quran, you know, you can't understand a verse in isolation. Uh, Rasulullah is the explanation to the Quran. So when we look at the Quran, in order to understand the Quran, we have to look at all of the surrounding factors to that revelation. You know, otherwise, you can come up with any explanation for anything. And this is where you see deviation occur, where people take things out of context you know, and make it fit themselves you know, just, just for their own convenience. You know, Allah SWT, and, and the thing is here also, we have to also, there, there's basic concepts that need to be understood. And if we understand these basic concepts, then everything else starts to fall into place. And this is also the issue that comes up is that people will take these basic concepts and then deviate from them. Uh, you know, where during the time of Sayyidina Ali, you know, the Khawarij, uh, they used to, their, their motto was uh, that uh, which is part of a verse of the Quran. 
in various places in the Quran, not just one place. In Il Hukmu illa Lillah, that there is no authority except Allah. And so Ali Radiyan, when he you know this was mentioned before him, he said Kalamatul Haq that the statement itself is is true. But what they infer from it, what they're drawing from it, is batil. It is misguidance. And so we see this you know, in various you know, actions of, and various statements that people make and various groups make as well. And so this is important to understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala about the Qur'an and not just really about the Qur'an, the text itself, but about all of revelation that was revealed to Rasulullah He says what? You know, in Surah Hijr, he says that we are the ones who have revealed this, dhikr, and we are the ones who will protect it. Inna nahnu nadhalnahu dhikr wa innahu that we are the ones who have revealed this dhikr so not just the text of the Quran but all of those things connected to it because everything from a Rasulullah is revelation that he does not say anything from himself from his own nafs but everything that he says is revelation. It is from Allah. You know, what he says, where he says it, the way he says it, to whom he says it, every aspect of his saying is again exactly how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him and loves him to do. So the text of the Quran, everybody understands that you know there's been no change or alteration within that. There's no debate on this. You know, anybody who even wants to debate this has left Islam. The narrations are there, they are protected. But then you also have other issues that or other false narrations that have been mixed in with it. So here you have to do the legwork to look for what is real and what is not. In the, in the text of the Quran, there's no need to look for it. It's there, that's it, end of story. However, in the narrations, now you have to look. Because Ali, he also gave us the criteria to look. Sayyidina Ali Karamallah Waj, you know, he said to the people, he said, oh people, many narrations will come to you. But before you accept anything, look and see if this is befitting to the status and honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if it is not, then don't even look at any, at any further. If it fits that, then look, and the, these two will be connected, look and see if it is befitting to the honor and the status of Rasulullah. Okay. And again, if it falls short in that, again, don't even look towards it. Toss it aside. The scholars of a hadith, what they did was, you know, you have all of these narrations coming. They didn't go through, okay, which fits these certain criteria. They had their own set of criteria. And the criteria was basically based on, okay, are the narrators truthful or not? And if it fit their criteria, they included it within their writings. Not because they necessarily accepted it, but so that later generations could now sort it out. So everything is there. It's all there, doesn't mean all of it's authentic, but it's there. And the authentic stuff is also there. So nothing got left out. They didn't filter much of anything. You know, and this concept was understood by the traditional scholars and still the traditional scholars, but the common person these days, unfortunately, they don't understand this concept because, you know, past couple of hundred years, you've had this, con you know, this concept that's been forced upon the people that, oh, if it's in Bukhari, Muslim, that's it. 
which also is not accurate. Because there are narrations within Bukhari that none of the traditional scholars have accepted. A simple example of that is where there's a narration in Bukhari where a certain person says that she uh, took out lice from the clothing of Rasulullah. Not even a fly would come and sit on Rasulullah, much less lice coming toward Rasulullah. So all of the traditional scholars have said, you know, this has no place in, in, uh, in accepting, there's no place in accepting this type of narration. Same thing again, you know, where there's a narration where Rasulullah allegedly, you know, after there was a pause in revelation between the first and the second revelation, Rasulullah would go to Hira with the intention of committing suicide. Again, if you look at what the traditional scholars have said about this, none of them accepted it. At the same token, there are narrations that are true. The problem, the thing is sorting it out. And, and it's not that complicated. If you understand the basics, which Ali, who is, you know, Babul Madina to let him, the door to the city of knowledge, you know, the criteria that he gave us, you know, is this befitting to the honor and status of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And one concept that is universal is that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Khair Khalqillah. He is the best of the creation of Allah. And Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is Kamil. You know, two words in Arabic that describe him, Kamal and Jamal. Beauty and perfection. Perfect in his beauty and beautiful in his perfection. And we see this, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about him in various ways in the Quran. And about his beauty and his perfection. Of course, you know, you ha we have to have eyes to see that though. And the eyes to see that is the utmost and unyielding love of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we fall short in that, then we don't see this. The battle between good and evil, uh, this has been an ongoing issue from the beginning. You know, we say from Adam and Islam, but in reality, even before that. You know, but it became more obvious with the creation of Adam and Islam because now Shaitan he revolts openly because of his ego. And Shaitan says that I will not, you know, leave the children of Adam. He is the enemy to all of the children of Adam and Islam. There are two enemies even though in reality they're one. But you have the enemy from the outside, which is easy to see, and also easy to deal with. But then you also have the enemy from within, which is more difficult to see and more difficult to deal with. When we look at the life of Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, when he was in Mecca, you, he, you know, the Muslims only had to deal with the enemy from the outside. You didn't have a fifth column, you know, in English what they term the fifth column, which is, you know, those who are trying to destroy things from within. You didn't have that in Mecca. Because in Mecca, there was no benefit to becoming Muslim, no worldly benefit to becoming Muslim. You know, if you became Muslim, and you declared your Islam, you openly declared war against the whole world. You know, all of society now was against you. You, know, you were boycotted. You know, you couldn't get anything to eat. You couldn't get married. You couldn't do anything. So only those who accepted Islam who truly believed who came into Islam for no other reason than for the pleasure of Allah and His Messengers. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That was it. 
When Rasulullah SAW emigrates from Mecca to Medina Munawwara, after the Battle of Badr, things changed. Because until Badr, everybody or all of the enemies of Rasulullah SAW had this concept that, oh, you know, uh, the Quraysh and, and the other Arabs will just finish him off and that'll be it. We don't have to worry about anything else. But after Badr, now people started realizing that, oh, you know, maybe Quraysh won't be able to, to do the job. So now other things start happening. Now in Medina, now there is a, a worldly benefit to becoming Muslim. Because if you become Muslim and you go out on the expeditions, maybe you'll get some of the spoils of war. And those who are truly the enemies of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they see that, well, we're unable to finish him off from the outside, so now let's try to do it from the inside. You know, like termites. You know, they eat your home and you don't even realize it until it's too late and the foundation is all gone. You know, so this is what, what starts happening. You have those who are solid you know, and their hearts are where they're supposed to be, you know, full of the love of Allah and His Messenger. But now you have those who are coming in, openly declaring Islam, but the heart is somewhere else. And of course, the leader of this group in Medina Munawwara was Abdullah ibn Ubay. He is one of the leaders of Khazraj, which is one of the which is the bigger Arab tribe in our, in Medina. Before Rasulullah Sallallahu came to Medina Munawwara, the people of his tribe were going to make him king of Medina, literally. To the extent that it even made a crown for him. Of course, when Rasulullah Sassam comes, who can be king in front of Rasulullah Sassam? No one. So all of his hopes and dreams were gone. His son and daughter both became true Muslims. He initially would not accept Islam, but now after Badr, he says, oh, I'm also joining you. But if you look at his life, every moment he got, he tried to under, undercut or undermine the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Even till his last breath when he died. He died in the ninth year of Egypt, toward the end of the ninth year of Egypt. This concept of trying to under not undermine Islam from within did not die with him. Uh, when you have people like this, even when they die, they leave thousands of, of disciples. And this is what he did. So you have, you know, large groups who have, or, or groups at that time, who yeah, openly were Muslim, but they wanted to undermine the system. And they're working. Some of them Rasulullah SAW exposed openly. Some of them he did not. You know, the narration, which is uh, Ibn Hajar Asqalani when in his Shara Bukhari, uh, when he talks about uh, the hypocrites, he mentions this in, when he's uh, giving the tafsir of, of Sahih Bukhari. That one day, you know, the companions they knew, you know, certain people's attitudes are just obvious. And, and I'm going to come back to the attitude part in a second. And so they were, you know, they were eager to have Rasulullah Sallallahu expel these people. Of course, Rasulullah Sallallahu even when he knows, and he knows, Allah SWT has already given him the knowledge, he would not act upon it until the order came. <laughs> so, 
So one day he gets up on the on the member and he starts calling out names. So and so, get out, you are a hypocrite. So and so, get out, you know, this is Juma. And so he calls out the names of 36 people who he expels from the masjid. That day, Omar Radiallahu was late for Juma. And so as he's coming in, these people are going out. And he becomes, you know, just very saddened that he's missed Juma today. But then when he enters the masjid, the people are congratulating him, saying, Oh, oh Omar, be happy because the Rasulullah has expelled the hypocrites today. So some of them he exposed like this because Allah's command came to expose them. And some of them he did not expose openly. Uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, he did not expose openly. Everybody knew it though. You know, he didn't need to expose him openly. It was understood. You know, and anybody who didn't understand was blind. But if you look at the attitudes of the companions towards Abdullah ibn Ubay, they everybody knew who he was. Later on, the companions would say that if we wanted during the, and Omar Radio himself, he, he made a statement. Omar Radio, he said that you know, the, during the time of Rasulullah we used to, you know, revelation would come and we would know who is a hypocrite and who is a, a true believer. But now revelation has stopped. So we will go based on your attitude. If your attitude is that of a believer, then we will treat you as such. If your attitude is that of a hypocrite or a disbeliever, we will treat you as such. Rasulullah Sallallahu said to Ali radiallahu that only a true believer, only a mu'min, only a mu'min will love you and only a hypocrite will have animosity towards you. And this is why many of the companions, including Abdullah ibn, uh, Abdul ibn Abbas, he said that, you know, during our time, you know, if we wanted to know who was a hypocrite and who was a believer, we would simply look at their attitude towards Ali. You know, we would take the name of Ali and we would look upon their faces and we would know who is who. You know, if, if we said the name of Sayyidina Ali and their faces lighted up, then we know this is a believer. And if their faces, you know, kind of got wrinkled, then we knew this is a hypocrite. The Rasulullah in, in a narration, he also said, he said that if all of, the, if all of creation was unified on the love of Ali, or had become unified upon the love of Ali, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not have created the hellfire. Again, during the time of Sayyid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this was not such a big issue. Because Rasulullah Sallallahu was there, and if any issue came up, then he would be the one to decide. And if anyone disagreed with his decision, then it was understood who he was. The issues started coming later. Some issues were there and other issues were created. Meaning there was nothing there, but later on people took it out of context or out of place. And we've talked about Fidaq or Fadaq, you know, which Sayyidina Abu Bakr radiyallahu anh, took and placed in Baytul Mal. And when the, the, the daughter of Rasulullah, so some Bibi Fatima, salam alayhi came and asked for it. So I'm not going to go over that. 
And I've talked about that before uh, in some detail, so I'm not going to go over that. But that is also something that people use to create an issue where there was no issue. Another thing that they use to create an issue where there is no issue is that, you know, when Abu Bakr was chosen as the Khalifa, Ali was not there. I'm going to start on this today. I won't have time to finish this and we'll go over it more next week, inshallah. When when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he passed you can imagine the situation of the companions or rather unfortunately we cannot imagine the situation of the companions it means we have no concept of love anymore before that Rasulullah had assigned Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to lead the Salat when he was not there. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he led 17 Salat during the time of Rasulullah when Rasulullah was not in the Masjid. Because Rasulullah had appointed him to lead the Salat. When Rasulullah passed, and you know you have all this turmoil first question came up is where do we bury him Abu Bakr is the one who said that uh, Rasulullah told him that the prophets are buried where they pass so he passed in the house of Bibi Aisha Siddiqah so that is where he will be buried another question came up as to whether he should be given, given ghusl Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi is pure. Every aspect of him is pure. So why do you need to give ghusl to one who is pure? So the decision was made that they would give him ghusl, not because he needs to be given ghusl, but so that this would become a sunnah for the ummah. But then they decided also that they would give him ghusl, but they would give him ghusl through his clothes, so they would not take the clothes off. And Ali radiyan is the one who gave him ghusl. And as he was doing that, any water that would collect in the blessed eye sockets of Rasulullah he would suck it up you know, and drink it. Or in his navel, the same thing. Which is why later on Abu Bakr Radun requested Ali Radun to give him ghusl when he passed. He said, give me ghusl with the same hands that you gave ghusl to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Time's up. Uh, I will continue from here next week. But there's a lot of detail that needs to be understood because before we can understand Karbala. Uh, and so this is going to take some time and it's going to take me a few weeks to really go over this properly and I'm still skipping over a lot of stuff uh, but uh, you know these are points that we need to understand because within Karbala we see all of Islam and if, you, if we don't understand Karbala then in reality we don't understand Islam and anybody can say oh you know where are you talking about Islam uh, I can you know I'm saying this soundly that if someone does not understand Karbala and the actions of Imam Hussein al-Islam and what he did and why he did what he did he has no understanding of Islam it is all there and this is also where Rasulullah Sussam he says you know that uh, he talks about his itrati his family that he's leaving two very heavy things the Quran and his family and he also said that the Qur'an and the family will never be separated. So if we want to understand the Qur'an, we have to understand the family. And Imam Hussein al-Islam is a, is a pivotal, pivotal part of that family. Uh, so inshallah, I'll continue from here next week. You know, may Allah give us understanding.
fill our hearts with his true love and the true love of his beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, his family, his companions and all those whom they love inshallah those who have not made sunnah go and make sunnah inshallah